Well, hello everybody. Good evening and welcome to uh, PCS Union Facebook Live. I'm Mohammed Shafiq. I'm the chair of the PCS National Black Members Committee. And we're talking about Black Lives Matter and trade unions. And I'm really proud of the fact that over these past few weeks and months of the pandemic, PCS has been at the heart of understanding the issues that affect our members and particularly our black members and making sure that we are raising that in the negotiations with the government and the civil service. So wherever you are joining us, uh, I hope you're keeping safe and your families are well. I'm really proud also of the fact that um, our guest speaker is our national vice president, Zita Holborn. She's a, an extraordinary strong character uh, with an amazing amount of energy. And I'm really looking forward to hearing her experiences and thoughts on the topic. Uh, we will be joined very shortly by the signer. Um, so for those colleagues who need that, uh, apologies for the slight delay on that. And what we're going to do is uh, Zeta is going to present to you and then we're going to open up for some questions. We've had some questions in advance, but if you do really want to ask a question, then please post it in the comments section. And finally, before I hand over uh, and welcome Zita, please, uh, any messages of solidarity, put it into the box. Uh, we'll pick that up very, very shortly. But Zita, good evening and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Good evening and thank you for that um, wonderful welcome and introduction, uh, Mohammed. Um, and good evening to everybody who is watching. Um, we wanted to hold this event because we felt it was important to help that wants to join today um, why Black Lives Matter is a trade union issue. Um, I'm, uh, as Mohammed has said, one of the national vice presidents of PCS, and I'm the group vice president in Bayes. Um, I've been a, a trade unionist for uh, at least three decades and counting, and um, I've been involved in community activism, human rights campaigning, and trade unionism um, for most of my uh, lifetime, you know, from quite a young age and um, particularly focused on campaigning um, for equality and for justice and for rights, for human rights, workers' rights, and um, for freedom. So <clears throat> we um, uh, have been campaigning as a union for race equality for as long as we've existed. Um, equality is at the heart of the trade union movement, and therefore it has to be a priority in the work we do. Um, we've had black structures in our union for that length of time. And just to explain to anybody who's not familiar, you know, with our structures, when we use the term black, we use it in the broadest political sense in the trade union movement. So the TUC and PCS and other unions have black seminars, black forums, um, but it's an all encompassing term, which is including people who are visibly black, Asian and minority ethnic or you know, to use the uh, USA term, people of colour. Um, so we have a National Black Members Committee. Um, we have an annual Black Members Seminar. Um, we attend the TUC Black Workers Conference and I represent PCS currently on the Trade Union Congress Race Relations Committee. Um, so we've been organising around race equality for a long time and following the uh, horrific murder of George Floyd, our National Black Members Committee issued a statement of solid solidarity with George Floyd's family and with the wider Black Lives Matter movement, which actually isn't just a USA movement, as we've seen, it's here in the UK, it's in Brazil, it's in other European countries, it's a global movement. Um, and when people say Black Lives Matter, we are not saying that no other lives matter. And, um, you know, when we, when we do say Black Lives Matter, we sometimes receive some backlash from people who start to say all lives matter or white lives matter. And that is um, really painful and offensive for us because we are not saying that nobody else's lives matter. 
you know, Black Lives Matter is not just a slogan. It's not just a, a hashtag. It's a rallying call to say, we need to be included too. We deserve equality and equal rights too. Our lives matter. And the particular type of racism that people have been campaigning against through the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is about Afrophobia and anti-Black racism. But of course, as a trade union, we campaign against all uh, racism that exists, not just in the workplace, but in society. So recently, we've had two meetings with the, the Cabinet Office, um, which were headed up as Black Lives Matter and the impact on BAME workers of COVID-19. Um, and we are negotiating with the government around what they should and could do. And what we've said is that they, could, they should really be doing a complete overhaul of their HR policies, which discriminate and have been allowed to discriminate. You know, it's fine to have words and to state that Black Lives Matter and to state that you're for race equality, but what we really need is action to put that into practice. But we don't just organize um, you know, in the workplace, we organize in wider society. PCS has a proud history of um, working with race equality grassroots and campaigning organizations like Barrett UK, which is actually my organization, Stand Up to Racism, Show Racism the Red Card, and many others. We've been campaigning for Windrush justice um, and against the hostile environment in uh, recent years. We've supported many race justice campaigns, family race justice campaigns, um, working with families who have lost loved ones through uh, the hands of the state or through racist attacks. And that goes right back to Stephen Lawrence. We, rep we had representation from PCS on the TUC Stephen Lawrence task group. And we just agreed at the TUC that we would revive that task group and have a race equality task group, which is looking at um, outcomes and actions that need to take place to bring about race equality in the UK. So, um, you know, our, our work on race equality is important, but it isn't just the responsibility of our black representatives in the union. It is actually the responsibility of all our um, union representatives. Um, and it's something that we want to bring to all members in the way we would all other um, equality structures and groups and initiatives and campaigns that we have. Well, thank you so much. Time, Hamid. Sorry? How am I doing for the time? I thought I paused there. No, I think it's really, really good to get the initial uh, opening remarks, but I, I wanted to pick up about that debate about the legacy of colonialism that has been raging across, not just the United States, but here in the UK as well and uh, reparation, uh, enslavement, statues. How would you see uh, that issue being addressed? So I think that that's actually really important. If we don't address um, the historical racism um, and the legacy of colonialism and enslavement, then um, we can't really move forward. And what we see is that those legacies exist in policies, in structures, in institutions, and of course in symbols where we've been having the debate more widely uh, around uh, statues in particular. Um, and that's something that we've raised directly with the cabinet office in the talks that we've been having and said that they have to address those legacies if they're really serious about addressing institutional racism. Seeing, um, you know, statues of people who enslaved our ancestors, you know, who pillaged and stole from our ancestors, who tortured and murdered our ancestors, that can't possibly be right. It causes a lot of pain, it causes a lot of hurt, but what it also does is say that, well, actually the historic racism existed is okay. We're hearing some people in that debate defending those statues saying, oh, well, um, it's history and it's in the past so the statues should remain because they document history. Well, you can document history in a way where there's a narrative. You could have those statues yeah. in a museum where there are resources to actually talk about the legacy and to talk about what they did and how it impacted on people and why it was wrong and why it was horrendous 
um, you know, with an educational tool attached to it. I don't think that they should be, you know, out there being celebrated with no narrative and no detail or information about what they actually stood for. Um, so it's time that we did have that debate. You know, there's the honor system, there's the medals, and we've been having a discussion also about the St. Michael and St. George medal, um, which is awarded for services to the Commonwealth and that legacy as well. So I think that those issues do need to be addressed going forward. We can't just say we are draw a line on what happened before because um, the pain of what happened before is still with people. There is a campaign, there is a big movement in the UK for reparations. And what I would say about that, people often think when you're talking about reparations, you're talking just about financial reparations, but it's also about healing as well. And that's equally as important. Yeah, and one of the other things that really plays up, if you look at the legacy of successive governments from the last Labour government uh, in 2008, there was a, there's been an attempt, a successful attempt to marginalise race equality in government departments, in uh, delivery of services that we see in our country. And PCS has been at the forefront of campaigning against that. Do you think George Floyd's brutal murder and all the protests that have happened is a significant moment where race equality uh, is back at the heart of everything that we should be doing? It has brought to the forefront in everybody's minds and hearts the reality of racism. Um, and so those protests bring visibility to the racism that exists in society. George Floyd is not the first person or even the last person, the most recent person to be killed by the hands of the state, by the police, sadly and unfortunately. Um, but there is this opportunity for this to be a turning point, but it really does mean that all of us have to take action but all of the institutions and governments that are responsible mm. have to be held accountable. And it can't just be empty words and statements. We've seen institution upon institution, business upon business issue a Black Lives Matter declaration and statement over recent weeks. But the reality is amongst those organizations are organizations that don't have black people on their, on their boards. Um, that have barriers to participation and promotion and progression, discrimination in their appraisal systems, may not even have uh, robust race equality strategies in place in their organization. So they really need to put into practice what they're saying. Now, they can't just talk it, they need to walk it because this is about real people's lives. This is about pain and torture and underrepresentation and discrimination and barriers that people are living with generation upon generation right now. Um, some shout outs and uh, thank you to everybody who's watching, uh, particularly Hector Wesley, who is an NEC member. And can I just say I'm proud of the fact that not just in the leadership role, we've got Zeta, but also on our NEC, we have a significant amount of uh, black uh, members. I'm proud of the fact that's happened. We've got Annette Rochester, Angela Grant, uh, Zeta Holborn, Hector Wesley, and I've missed somebody um, from the aviation group. Yes. Okay. Tahir. Well, I'll find out, I'll Tahir find out who Latif. that is. Sorry? Tahir Latif. Yes, Tahir Latif yes. Uh, as well. Um, and and, and in, if you look at that, Zeta, if you look at other trade unions and the lack of representation. I'm not saying it's perfect, but we certainly are ahead of the curve in that we've got significant people uh, in very important roles in our movement. I'd say that we had to work to get there, you know, so our black members working alongside the rest of the union and the NEC and the leadership of the union work to get that representation. And, um, you know, we can't be complacent because we need people at every level of the union that are representative of all equality groups, including uh, black members. And sometimes the barriers that exist are at that first level of um, participation. Sometimes what it takes is actually encouraging or asking somebody to get involved, making sure they know about the structures, making sure that they can get to the meetings, making things accessible and equal for everybody to participate. And actually that also means that sometimes 
people that have been holding on to posts and positions for a long, long time might need to consider stepping aside or doing something different to mm. allow other people to have the opportunity to be there. But we also need to organize ourselves, you know, in terms of that representation and those roles and to support each other. Yeah, well, welcome also to Anil Kula, uh, who is a great activist from uh, the Northern Group, Northern Region up in Newcastle. So why I manage this uh, up there. Uh, thank you also, uh, Solidarity from Glasgow DWP Branch, HMRC Portstown Vectis, RNC London, RNC Criminal Justice uh, Branch, also RNC West Mercia, HMRC Fraud Investigation, uh, MOJ Midwest, uh, and also very warm welcome to our good friend, Martin Kavanagh, who's the PCS uh, president uh, of the DWP group, but he's also vice president, um, deputy president, I think, of uh, PCS. Um, PC Arms as well. So um, if you are retiring after long service, maybe you want to consider joining Arms. So thank you so much, Arms. And OK, and, and also there's uh, issues around a one minute silence um, around reflecting on all those people from BME communities, but actually all people uh, from all parts of society who passed away. Uh, we'll, 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 if we have time at the end, we'll certainly do that. But Zita, you talked about um, the cabinet office and the negotiations you're having with that. I was touched by our Zoom call a few weeks ago where Mark was generally looking to you to take a leadership role in this and amplifying your voice uh, is that what actually happened in those negotiations? Um, yes, so myself and the Assistant General Secretary, uh, John Maloney, we led um, those talks. So there were others present. Mark was present, Fran, our president was present, Martin, who you've mentioned, was present. But we led the talks and the union recognises actually having somebody lead those talks who is on the receiving end of uh, racism who can speak firsthand and who is black is actually really important. Um, and so uh, that I think is something that we should see across the trade union movement. And I go by the slogan, nothing about us without us. You can't be having conversations about us and talk about what happens to us without us being in the conversation and leading that conversation. And that's why it's important that our voices are, as, as black trade unionists, are on all decision-making bodies and in those negotiations and in those talks, because nobody who has walked in our shoes can speak in the same way about our experiences. And, you know, we've been speaking to the cabinet office about um, Black Lives Matter, which is well, what they've headed up the, the meetings and what they should be doing in terms of bringing around race equality. But we've also been speaking about an aspect um, of COVID-19 and the pandemic that's disproportionately impacted on um, Black communities and Black workers. Um, and that is that we are um, contracting COVID and dying disproportionately. Um, and so what we've said to the cabinet office is that there needs to be protections for black workers in place. There needs to be individual assessments. There needs to be quality impact assessments as well as generic risk assessments that those assessments can't just be looking at what happens when you get to the workplace, but what happens in you traveling to the workplace, the impact on other black workers who are public transport workers, for example, the impacts on those you care for and those you live live with and it has to include all of our members including our members who are outsourced workers who are facilities management workers who without them the buildings wouldn't function or run the people who are cleaners and caterers and security guards and who are also disproportionately mm. migrant women and black workers and uh, have been dying disproportionately so their needs and protection for them has to be a priority must be all workers, not just mm. the civil, the people who are civil servants. Absolutely, yeah. I, I just want to give you some more shout outs. Um, also, can I just plug that the All Rise uh, anti-racism, anti-fascism strategy um, has been relaunched. It's on the PCS website. It's a really good tool. Um, I've been involved in that. You can read my blog as well, uh, a, a plug there. 
but it's really important that we get the right uh, policies and procedures in place and tools. So please uh, have a read of that and any feedback you've got, you can uh, pass that through PCS Equality Office or through Simon Elliott. And um, thank you, Simon, for all the work that you've done on that. Um, Ian, uh, so we've got some questions uh, that are coming through, but also are coming through uh, on that we that we have in advance. But I just wanted to do the mentions. Hello, Julie Young. Um, let me just get through. Sorry. Solidarity from DEFRA London and Southeast Branch. Hello from DWP PCS London region. Um, okay, uh, DFS PCS Education Group, Patricia Hill, who's also a member of the National Black Members Committee. Hello also to my deputy, my vice chair, uh, my strength um, keeps me in check, uh, Tracy Hilton uh, from Liverpool. And uh, Solidarity from Liverpool Revenue Custom Branch, John Lynch. Mandy Curran, Solidarity from Dundee Pension Centre. And hello to Mark Page. Solidarity uh, from Sarah Jane from the PCS DWP Liverpool. Uh, HMRC Leeds, Matthew Caven. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, then we've got um, Mel B, Tony uh, Moore. Welcome. Sorry, I'm just going through this. Uh, and PCS Biz Group. Uh, I'm glad they're online because they're, it's your group. So uh, we're glad that uh, that's sorted. And uh, also, can I just ask you, should we just go to those questions? Why is our union, I mean, this is one of the questions that comes up, why are we not focused on getting us a decent pay rise rather than Black Lives Matter? Sorry, what's the question? Why are Wait. we yeah so so one of the persons says why is the union pcs not focusing on the pay rise okay. and just focusing on black lives matter well first of all thank you for all those shout outs and messages of solidarity those are so important and they give us strength um well we're focusing on both we could you know we can multitask we can do more and we've just launched a, our pay campaign we've got a petition this is a major priority for us pay um, but that doesn't mean to say if we do one thing, that's the only thing we can do and we can't do anything else. Mm. And trade unions do a multitude of different things at the same time. We're negotiating with employers on a whole host of issues in each bargaining area, each employment area. We're campaigning nationally on um, pay and rights and terms and conditions. Um, we're raising equality issues. We're raising issues on behalf of our outsource workers. We have culture sector workers who have launched a campaign as well. Um, so there are a whole host of things. So we are doing both. So it isn't a, a, a matter of Black Lives Matter is the only thing we're focused on and nothing else. Mm. And of course, we don't just have um, a focus on race equality. Um, you know, we have LGBT plus members, we have disabled members, women members, young members, we have structures for all of those equality groups. And we fight and campaign for all of those groups as well. Everybody who has a protected characteristic um, that we campaign and fight for. And we're here for all mm. our members, not just some. But at the moment, there is a major issue of racism facing our black members and black people more widely in society. So it's quite right that we as a trade union respond to that and focus on that alongside all the other things we're focusing on. Yeah, that's a really good point, Zita. I mean, in a sense, the people who criticise the union should remember that it's a conservative government that has supported austerity, has forced 1% pay rises and pay reductions uh, on our members. And it's the union that's fighting back against that. We, we've had a pay campaign, haven't we, that um, the NEC has been uh, leading on. Um, and it's just because of the arcane uh, legislation that is stopping us uh, from expressing ourselves. So, yeah. It's great that you're holding um, Zeta and the NEC to account, but just remember uh, the real reason why we're not getting a pay rise is because of the government's inaction on that. Um, so should we move on to some of these questions, if that's okay with you, Zeta? Uh, the first one is, is there any possibility of people of color fighting the establishment as one force rather than being splintered, i.e. all BME members from all unions as one force? Okay. So I think we're already doing that. As I mentioned at the, the beginning, we use black in its broadest political sense. So it does mean BAME people or people of color or whatever term you want to use. Um, but we have to also recognize that we do have 
multiple identities and that's quite right for us to do so so when we organize as a trade union movement we have a black members committee we have a black members seminar and the same at tuc level we have a tuc black workers conference um, so we do organize across the trade union movement we have networks of black representatives from across unions We've been having during lockdown a series of meetings around race equality and the, all the other equality areas at TUC level, as well as our regular race relations uh, committee meetings. But in addition, we have other identities. So we identify as black in its broadest political sense when we're organizing in trade union movement. Black Lives Matter is focused on, as I mentioned, Afrophobia. Um, and anti-black racism and particularly, you know, the, um, the discrimination that black people face at the hands of the state. Um, you know, we may be Muslim women, Londoners from Manchester. We have um, a multiple Liverpool. identity as individuals. We can have all of those identities and we can relate to the groups that we belong to whilst at the same time organizing collectively. Okay, that's really good. And I just wanted to mention that the DWP group uh, led by Martin Kavanagh have got the safeguards in place for a BME risk assessment. So if there's DWP colleagues on who are from a BME background and are really worried about going back to work, you, your employer, your manager must complete a BME risk assessment. You can go to the PCS website and find further information. Uh, on that. But there's a question related to that, Zita. Due to the high percentage of COVID-19 deaths among black people, will employers be giving black employees the option to remain working from home um, as offices begin to reopen? So, yes, it's fantastic that um, our colleagues in DWP have that in place. And it's what we've been raising at the cabinet office level. So, um, you know, what I was mentioning earlier about the fact that within our five tests, we've said that there needs to be a quality impact assessments, individual mm. impact assessments, um, looking not just at the workplace. And so what we've been negotiating with the, the government for all departments is that, yes, there should be a toolkit that protects um, black workers because we are dying disproportionately and they have sent us a draft and we've um, responded this week with our comments so we're waiting to hear back from them there will be a follow-up meeting so it's something we're taking forward and I would say that if anybody's workplace is going to open up and they have concerns about going into work um, they should come to their trade union representative locally and let them know what those concerns are. They should raise them with their manager. All departments have been told that they need to put something in place. That they've written to all permanent secretaries to say that they need to be addressing these issues around COVID and the particular impact on um, uh, black workers, but of course other groups as well that may be vulnerable. So the people who are over a certain age, um, people with some disabilities, pregnant women, um, any group that is vulnerable or high risk should be protected and supported um, and not put at risk by the employer. And if you have any concerns, you should definitely make PCS aware so we can support you. Yeah, thank you. So this is a question about internal PCS structures. It's from Ian Hoff. Um, or oh, how should I, sorry, apolo apologize if I mispronounce your name there, sir. Uh, how many black full-time officers are involved in decision-making as there have not been elections who are making the decisions? I think there's two questions there. One about full-time officers, i.e. the employees of the union. How many of the top people in those positions are from a black background? And then um, the fact that we haven't had any elections, who's making those decisions? Well, uh, the vice president's looking at me on this screen, so I'm assuming you're in a pretty high position there, Zita. <laughs> um, so, yes, we do have um, black people in different leadership positions working for the union, doing all different roles. Um, in fact, we've lost two very high profile um, black representatives who work for the un union. Um, Shivana, um, uh, quite recently, Shivana Taj, um, who's now the Wales TUC secretary, which is fantastic news. Um, and uh, Felisa Pokajima, who was the head of equality and previously the head of campaigns. So we have people um, in leadership, but in terms of decision making, decision, it's a lay led union. Um, so it's, you know, led by the membership. 
And so our national executive committee and our group executive committees make decisions. It's not just um, full-time officers fulfilled that role. Um, and um, in t the point about not having had elections, which we haven't had because of COVID and lockdown and safety, um, the people that held positions for the previous year are still in post for the time being. Yeah, it's really good. I hope that answers your question, Ian. But certainly if there's anything else you want to ask us, get in touch with Zita and myself and the National Black Members Committee through the uh, Equality Department of PCS. Um, so how can senior leaders be educated on the full range of issues affecting BME staff? Who will be responsible for overseeing it? And how confident are you that this will occur swiftly? So this is something that we've raised with the Cabinet Office in the recent talks that I've mentioned. And some of you may be aware of the Windrush Lessons Learned report, which is a long overdue uh, report that looked at the Home Office and um, you know what part it played in the Windrush scandal. And it concluded that um, the department was uh, institutionally ignorant of racism. And it made a number of recommendations, 30 recommendations, I believe it was. And the government has just recently announced that they are going to implement all of those recommendations. What we've said to the cabinet office is that the recommendations on the home office are actually relevant across the whole civil service. And so they should be taken forward in every area. So some of the things that were mentioned were um, teaching black history, reviewing race equality, um, training and having proper race equality training, um, ensuring that people understand the legacies of colonialism and enslavement, um, ensuring that they equality proof all their systems, that there's an equality board that oversees things, that they monitor race um, discrimination cases and address the outcomes of those and the patterns of those. So we've said that this is something that should happen across the board. But I also think um, senior um, uh, um, representatives in the civil service, they could um, engage more with and speak to them and learn firsthand about their experiences, experiences. And actually, you could do reverse mentoring, which has does happen in some areas sometimes, so that they actually learn, learn firsthand from um, black workers of what their lived experience is like in terms of having to counter discrimination and prejudice every day. Okay, and then the next one is from Andrew Roach. He says, how can we eradicate and confront racism in workplaces? I'm assuming he's possibly referring to what happened in Wales, DWP, where a black uh, member of staff was racially discriminated and got a £400,000 payout. You know about the case, I know about the case, but what can we do to, as a union, can we do to eradicate that racism from people's workplaces? Well, I think we really need to be organised on the ground in all workplaces. We need to consult and engage with our black members. And if they're not members, with black workers, encourage them to be involved in the union. We need to make our employers accountable. So we need to be robust in our negotiations. Um, we need to have strong strategies and policies ourselves. Um, we need to involve people in our black structures because we know that um, through getting involved in our equality structures, that's how people often then get involved more widely in the union and gain confidence and support to take up representative roles because our voices need to be in all of those discussions. It's important we're there and we're represented and we need to support each other so that people can come forward and speak out about their experiences. And if people are going through discrimination, I would encourage them to come forward early. Don't wait till you hit rock bottom and it's really, really bad, which is often what people do. They try and just be strong and carry on and get through it. And then it hits a crisis point. Um, come to us earlier so that we can try and support you to prevent it from getting worse in the first place. And we need to speak out. And I know that's not always easy when you're on the receiving end of racism, but we also need allies. So our um, white colleagues in the trade union uh, structures that we have, 
um, we need to speak out. They need to speak out when they witness racism, um, when they see that there are racist policies in place. They need to bring, um, you know, practical solidarity um, to, to the table and ensure that um, we work together and we stand together and we root out any racism that exists even in our own structures because it's important that we have our own house in order as a wider trade union movement if we are going to be effective in um, uh, saying to our employers mm. they must root out racism. Um, it's a really good question from Jackie Hadfield who's from my former branch and she's the part of the arms uh, group. Is any action being taken by PCS parliamentary group on the Public Health England report on the dis disproportionate number of deaths amongst BME people due to COVID? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's something that um, we've raised um, with the Cabinet Office. So there's the ONS report and there's the Public Health England report, which provides the evidence that COVID is impacting disproportionately. Um, and we have raised um, through our parliamentary group the impacts for our facilities management um, workers as well, members. Um, so, and there's always more we can do. So it's always good to use a parliamentary arm, um, you know, a legal arm, anything and everything that we can at our hands um, to raise these issues. Um, and there's a really good suggestion here. I'm just going to get it. Um, from Claire Keane, and she says she'd like to see the union working on ensuring all branches, is, uh, all branches, uh, branches, is, sorry, let me put my teeth back in, uh, have branches have active working black member structures at a branch level. How important is that? Well, we have the facility to do that. So it's in our policy for branches can set up um, uh, equality um, subcommittees for all of the equality groups. Um, so the, the, you know, we can do it. It's a matter of organizing ourselves in our branches to encourage our black members to come together, identifying where our black members are, supporting them, setting up the structure. And of course, when, once it's set up, if there are not black members already involved, that they should lead it. Um, so sometimes what we have to do to try and get those up and running is to actually organize some members meetings around the issues we know are of concern to our black members. And that's the way that we can encourage people to come forward and get involved in setting up those structures. But they are very important on a local level because it gives um, our black members an opportunity to get involved in the union in what would be a safe space to speak out about the issues that impact on them but also then to be there in a role that they can advise the branch executive committee on the issues that they need to be taking forward mm. on behalf of black members and representing them. Um, can I also just plug racism and intolerance changing attitudes in the workplace? We were talking about workplaces. It's a PCS one day workshop um, and talks um, utilizing materials developed by the TUC and anti-racism organizations to help build confidence in challenging far-right ideas and racism and having those difficult conversations. Obviously, at the moment, it's a, it's a course available online through the PCS Academy. You can get more information on the PCS resources and learning website uh, as well for people who are interested in that. And uh, let's move on. We've got a question. Black BME, B-A-M-E, B-A-E-M, black and brown people, People of colour, how do we come together when we try to divide, dilute our identities? Um, so just on the point about diluting identities, going back to you know, a previous question, I don't think that it is a matter of us diluting. I think it is the fact that we have multiple identities and therefore at different times we will um, you know, identify with that group. And I could identify with being um, of mixed heritage, of being from the African diaspora, of being Caribbean and being a Londoner at any given time. But in terms of our union structures, we already organize under the political term black to bring all of those groups that have just been mentioned together so that we work together and stand together against racism because we know that the, the common enemy that we face of racism um, means that we're stronger when we stand together. And whilst we may, there may be differences in the types of discrimination we face on race grounds, um, actually there is that commonality that means that it's better that we organize and work together as a black member structure within the trade union. 
And I suppose a follow-up question would be, there are some people, um, people that I've spoken to, you've spoken to, who generally wouldn't uh, be happy to be described as black and, you know, might have the identity of being Asian or Pakistani or Indian or Chinese. Um, I don't really, you know, understand the term black as a political term. Uh, what can we do to encourage them to get involved in our structures? I think it's really important that when we use the term black, that we define it and explain it. And I think we tried to do that on communications to explain we use black in this sense, and this is why we um, do it, to explain some of the history of how um, black and Asian and other people of color have come together historically, you know, decades previously under that umbrella uh, term um, and why we do it, that we do it as a, to be in a position of strength and unity and to work collectively together. And that that doesn't in any shape or form take away any other identity that you have. It's not erasing those identities. They exist, as I've just mentioned about my own multiple identities. Mm. Um, but I think we do need to have those conversations. And yes, some people have never come across that term. And in America, they use people of color. And I know there's a bit of a debate going on about that. And it seems like um, there's some younger people, younger generation of activists that prefer that American term here in the UK. Um, but there, there is a debate and a discussion about it, but we feel very strongly across the trade union movement that black is a, a term that unites us and makes us stronger in terms of organizing against racism. You've been, you've been involved in this important work for decades. And, but do you think this is different the murder of George Floyd, the reaction, the sense that lots of people in America who are coming out were young white people who wanted to show solidarity. Do you think this is an historic moment? I think it could be a historic moment. I think that we've seen deaths at the hands of the police and at the hands of the state, both in the USA and in the UK. In the UK. And I've been organizing solidarity protests and protests and supporting family justice campaigns for many, many years on these issues. We've had lots of protests. We've had lots of campaigns. I think the fact that his murder was captured on screen and then shared across the world um, really had an impact on people. It was horrific to say, to see. But for some of us, you know, that seeing that is triggering. For people that have um, experience police brutality or who have lost loved ones, they weren't um, fast to watch that video, yeah, because it was too triggering and too traumatizing for them to do so. But I think that it happening and it being documented in that way did impact on a lot of people. Um, and it's the first time, I think what's different as well, as you've said, we've got lots of white people out on the streets campaigning as well and bringing solidarity um, and you know the, the the marches and protests I've organized over the last two decades we don't see a lot of people outside of our own community on those marches and protests usually and I would encourage everybody that's here to join the United Family and Friends campaign annual march against death in custody which is at the end of October every year obviously we don't know with COVID what's going to happen to this year's one but we do need that solidarity for all of those families that are impacted. And I think the other thing is that's different this time around is that we have all of these institutions and businesses declaring that Black Lives Matter. But what will make it a turning point in race relations is they actually put their words into action and address the institutional and systemic racism that exists in their own organizations. If they don't do that and they just put out a statement like it's a trendy thing to do that makes them look good and makes them popular mm. and then they forget about it the next day and do nothing, then nothing will change. But the people who have the power to make the change happen is all of us collectively, black and white. And so we, if we allow this moment to slip by and we don't do anything, then nothing will change. And there are all of these young people in the 
wider Black Lives Matter movement that are out there protesting. And we need to reach out to them, to give them support, to give them solidarity, to work together. And I think it's important as somebody who comes from a community activism background, as well as a trade union activism. And that's why I founded an organization that bring those two factors together or co-founded an organization that bring those two factors together. It's important that we act actually work with others that we don't just work in a trade union silo mm. we are out there in the communities working with communities and actually we have resources as trade unions that we can help um, you know local community groups and grassroots groups to actually campaign and we should support and bring practical solidarity not just messages of solidarity to those movements that are out there mm. and just reflecting on uh the brutal murder of George Floyd in that video, as George Floyd would say, I can't breathe. The police officer was saying to George Floyd, stop yelling. And I think it was really moving and powerful that people got to see the reality of what life is like uh, for uh, black people. And, and, and thank you so much, everybody who is giving your questions. And there are some questions that we obviously won't be able to answer because of time, I promise you, uh, what we will try to do is take them questions away, get some answers from Zeta, and we'll share them on the PCS website. Um, but I, I, I've been a member of PCS for 19 years in October. And for as long as I can remember, PCS has always been at the front line. Stand up to racism, unite against fascism, any sort of cause, justice for Jay Bhattan, uh, all those justice campaigns for families and victims, I always find PCS have been at the heart of that and somewhere in the middle, you've been there and, and people look to you as a role model, people look to you as somebody who's rooted in communities and that's why it's so important to support these causes. Um, yes, I think that we have a proud history of standing up to racism, mm. standing up to fascism um, and we need to continue that history um, we need to take it forward and to create a positive legacy for the next generation. The driving force for me throughout all of this is, you know, my child's generation that I didn't want to see, but unfortunately I have seen a new generation of young people having to grow up and fight racism. And we stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us, Absolutely. our families, uh, who came to the UK facing no blacks, no Irish, no dog signs, who faced horrendous uh, racism. But we've just gone through 10 years of austerity, which amplified racism in every aspect of society and life. Brexit had an impact as well. Um, and we are going to face, I mean, one of the impacts we haven't talked about very much today is not just the fact that we are dying disproportionately from COVID, but the reasons for that is because of poverty and discrimination in wider mm. society. And, and what we've had is an attempt to sort of other us and label us as people that are the problem, rather than looking at what has society been like over the last 10 years and more, that have caused us to die disproportionately. We're in the frontline jobs, we're in precarious work, we're living in poverty, we face discrimination, we're in poorer housing, all of these um, aspects of discrimination. And we have a fight on our hands going forward because the economic impacts that we're going to face going forward are going to be even worse. And the reason that I um, co-founded Barrack UK, Black Activists Rising Against Cuts, was initially to campaign against austerity, but it became a campaign. We've just had our 10 year anniversary against broader racism and discrimination. And those impacts, the economic impacts are going to impact on working class people disproportionately, but they're going to impact on black people and disabled people and women and younger and older people. And so we really mm. need to be organized and to be ready for this and to campaign and to learn from what happened the last time around, because it's us that's going to bear the brunt of that. Yeah. John, uh, sorry, John Paul Rosser asked 11 out of 18 personal cases in a HMRC branch, and they're all black members. Clearly, policies are disproportionately affecting black members. What can we do as a union to, to, to tackle that? Okay, so interestingly, I've been talking about something similar in a different department um, today with some members. 
Um, and I was talking about how when we identify these patterns, whilst people may not even be coming forward saying that their case is about racism, the pattern is that if it's black members that are coming forward um, to that extent, there is clearly an issue in that area. And I think we have to identify what those patterns are. Is it a particular manager, a particular issue like harassment and bullying? Um, is it a particular part of the department we're in that the prob where the problem lies? And we need to take that forward as a collective bargaining uh, issue with the employer because it shouldn't be the case that all, all these individuals just have to take up their own cases. We can do collective grievances as well. We can um, set up inquiries and investigations. Mm. We can report these issues to the EHR. Is that, is that something in terms of data as well? Sorry to interrupt there. How we can collect that data and then make those representations to HMRC, this cabinet office, to say, look, this is what the data is suggesting. Well, within our branches, we, um, you know, collate what types of cases we have. We document each of our personal cases through a form we call the PC1 form, which sets out um, equality data for that member, but also the type of case that they've got. So this is a particularly particular role for branches to identify those patterns and groups in the union to identify what those patterns are, which provides the evidence. And I've been involved over the years in the union with um, a number of race investigations where when we identify there is a pattern, we would then have one to one meetings or provide a system where those members can provide mm. evidence of the institutional or individual racism that they're facing in the organization. Because sometimes what we find is if the members are facing discrimination disproportionately, our black members, actually sometimes our customers have also, you know, the clients have also faced that. And so it isn't just about talking to the black members, it's about talking to all staff, but doing it in a safe environment and an environment where people feel confident um, about coming forward and speaking to us confidentially if they need to, because they don't want to be identified. And then we present the evidence and the reports that we've put together to the employer and you know, pin them down to take action on these issues. And I've done that a number of times in a number of okay. departments over yeah. the years. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's sent in their questions. Um, apologies if we're not able to get through them all. But what we will do is we'll go away and get some answers for you, <coughs> excuse me, from Zeta uh, or any relevant person within PCS to make sure uh, we capture that. And thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join us tonight. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure Zeta enjoyed it. And, and colleagues are finding it beneficial. So if they're you know, if people are uh, enjoying this and finding it beneficial, please let us know and we can put on um, further conversations around this and equality structures, because as you rightly said, there's multiple identities. There's the LGBT plus community, there's women, there's disabled people, um, and there's uh, carers. And so there's lots going on and, and lots of underrepresented groups that we have to stand together uh, in unity. Zita, as much as we could, me and you could carry on this conversation for hours on end, uh, I just want to go to you for your sort of final summary and conclusions and reflections. And I suppose one thing to prompt you as you as you do that, maybe to finish with, I never see you tired. I never see you uh, stop. You're always on the go. Well, uh, before the lockdown, it was traveling around the world, amplifying your voice, obviously now via Zoom and uh, online platforms. Where do you get the chance to pause, breathe and relax? Um, and where do you get the energy? Okay, um, so just I'll start with that question. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I don't, I, I don't sleep, that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah sleep is just like a waste of time. I haven't got time for it. Uh, I should probably sleep a lot more than I do, to be honest. Um, I'm an artist and a poet and a writer and an author. And actually that gives me strength. And that actually is like um, a form of self-therapy it's self-care and you could see behind me some of my um, paintings on the wall yeah. and around me and this is my downtime you know I paint I create art but I often create art about the things I'm campaigning on the uh, campaign for equality freedom and justice through activism but also through mm. um, the arts and actually that keeps me going um, you know, it, it gives me a lot of joy creating poetry, writing and um, painting. 
Um, in terms of, you know, what we can do collectively going forward is we need to speak out. When we witness racism, we need to speak out and we need to challenge it. Because when you're on the receiving end, it's not always that easy. So we need allies, you know, to be there and stand with us. We also need to recognize that those who are on the receiving end of discrimination and racism have to lead that struggle. So we need to allow space for us to speak, for us to lead that struggle. Um, we need to be vigilant. We need to organize. We need to um, mobilize. We need to support each other. And actually, we need to act out of love and out of care. Um, and realize that actually uh, racism is a human rights issue. And actually when we achieve race equality for black people, everybody benefits from that. So it's in everybody's interest to do that. And if we um, encounter racist or prejudiced ideas around us, whether it's in our family, in our communities, in our places of worship, or in our workplace, it's really important to have those conversations um, and speak to other people about it. And I'm not talking about just black people having to do that. I'm talking about all of us and white people doing that as well, because it's exhausting standing up to racism and challenging racism, because as soon as we walk out of the door, we know that we're going to encounter everyday racism, let alone the structural systemic racism that exists in our places of work and our educational institutions and so on and so forth. So we all have a responsibility, we all have accountability and we can all um, use our voice to take action yeah. and create a better society um, in our lifetime, equality in our lifetime, but a positive legacy for the next generation going forward. And education, I think, starts at home. It starts with our children, our community, our families. And if we have those conversations from a young age um, and we continue those conversations through generations, you. through communities, yeah. we can make that change. Well, thank you so much, Zita. Um, you're doing a fantastic job and maybe get some extra sleep tonight. Uh, now that we've had this uh, Facebook Live. Uh, Thank colleagues. you, Mohammed. Thank you so much for facilitating and chairing this and for all the work that you do for our National Black Members Committee as its chair in that position of leadership. It's really well, important. I'm really glad that we have you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you so much to everybody who's joined us this evening. Uh, as I said, apologies if I wasn't able to get through as many of those questions. We will see if we can uh, answer them and, and publish that on our uh, website as we go through. But if you've got an issue that you want to speak to, in the first instance, speak to your local rep, and if not, uh, contact your local groups. It's important, as Zita said, that the struggle against racism and xenophobia and bigotry is all our responsibility. Uh, we're stronger as a union, we're stronger as a movement by the presence of black members. And, you know, uh, I just feel, I feel so proud of our union, uh, our leadership, our union, and our struggles and our campaigns. And I salute you all for all the work that everybody's doing across this country. Please keep safe. But from me, Mohammed Shafiq, uh, Chair of the National Black Members Committee, and Zita Holborn, PCS Vice President, uh, an extraordinary campaigner. Thank you so much. Uh, take care of yourself and each other, and we'll see you very, very soon. Good night. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, everybody.